Hi, uh, I'm Mike Ham. I assume that many of you will remember me. I taught in the history program here from 1970 to 2014. And courses on Russia and the Soviet Union, modern Europe and the Middle East, plus the always popular history 110 and 120. What you probably don't know about me is that I've long been involved in conservation movements. I've been on the board and, and still on the board of trustees of the Kentucky chapter of the Nature Conservancy, for example. Conservation, environmental issues have been my passion. And uh, somehow I ended up being, uh, becoming one of the state's expert on the rapidly declining iconic monarch butterfly. In fact, I had an organization, the website address is forestformonarchs.org. We do the <clears throat> for reforestation and the forest monitoring for the monarch winter roost in Michoacan, Mexico, and I'll talk about that in this presentation. Um, I've chosen to do a presentation uh, based on an hour-long PowerPoint that I use. I, I uh, do it frequently at center for center classes. And I've also done a number of public re uh, lectures around the state. But I've compressed this into about a 20 minute presentation since the PowerPoint itself is about an hour in length and that's just too long. So let me begin. The title of my presentation is Saving the Monarch Butterfly. <clears throat> you may wonder why I start a lecture on the monarch butterfly with what is clearly not a butterfly. <laughs> and this animal certainly can't fly. <clears throat> but what I want to established by way of a bit of context, context is that we are losing wild creatures uh, at an alarming rate and the loss of biodiversity in, in my opinion anyway may be the most uh, alarming issue that we face today even though it seems to seldom enter the political dialogue in this country and in other countries. These are white rhinos that are photographed, and I'll start there, and you can read, I think, on the computer, and you can see what's happened here. 150 years ago, in Africa alone, uh, rhinos numbered more than a million. Now there are 6,000 white and 2,400 black rhinos left, and rhinos do not reproduce very rapidly. So when you kill a female rhino, uh, it's, a, it's a major, major issue. Um, so, when we talk about the loss of the monarch butterfly, if you put this in context, we're talking about just another wild creature that is rapidly disappearing, much like the iconic uh, animals in Africa and Asia. <clears throat> loss of habitat, we'll talk about that with regard to the butterfly. Here's a map of Africa that shows what's left of the historic range of the African giraffes. The beige color is the historic range. The sort of avocado green is all that's left. Habitat loss is an extremely, uh, is a very major problem almost for all of these creatures that are disappearing. There are other issues, but habitat loss seems to be uh, pretty common throughout. Interestingly, <clears throat> we don't think much about insects but insects are pollinators, they are predators, they are protein back prey for birds. As E.O. Wilson, the famous Harvard biologist said, they're the little things that run the world. Much of the food we eat is pollinated by insects. Their diversity and their abundance are plummeting. One example, a 27 year study in Germany discovered a 75% decline in insect biomass in the 63 protected areas that they studied. So even when we're talking about insects, and we don't think very much about insects, you're talking about at least the possibility of what entomologists are beginning to call an insect holocaust. On to the monarch butterfly. We didn't know where the monarch butterfly went in the wintertime. We knew it disappeared. We knew it could not withstand cold temperatures. The winter roosts 
uh, which happened to be 12 mountaintops, mostly in the state of Michoacan in west central Mexico. No one knew about this in the outside world until in the mid 70s, a young woman, Kathy Juado, her name was, and her boyfriend <clears throat> were hiking amount, around the mountains. The local people were very suspicious of both of them because they believed that they were searching for gold. It was rumored that gold was hidden in those mountains going back to the uh, Mexican Civil War. They're the first outsiders who stumbled upon one of these winter roosts. And that made such a splash that she uh, uh, was put on the cover. You can see the cover of National Geographic here in August, August 1976 issue. That's Kathy surrounded by trees filled with monarch butterflies. <clears throat> What do we know about the migratory monarch butterfly? The Aztecs called them souls of the dead as they returned each fall to, quote, help ensure a successful harvest. We know that the migration today may be longer because food sources have become scarcer. We know that because we, we have specimens in museum of what monarchs looked like in times past. The first thing you have to understand about the monarch butterfly is that it needs milkweed. It will not survive without milkweed. Uh, female monarchs lay their eggs on milkweed. They have the ability, apparently, to determine the level of toxicity in the milkweed. If it's too toxic, they avoid it. If it's not toxic enough, they avoid it. At the caterpillar stage, the monarch butterfly eats milkweed. This makes it toxic to predators. So that um, the only place you're gonna find monarch butterflies is where you have milkweed. And fortunately, there are a number of, of species of milkweed around the world, including three in Kentucky. <clears throat> you're talking here about four generations of monarch butterflies. The first generation the generation that comes back, comes in in March from Mexico, if it survives the winter roost, gets as far as Texas, maybe Oklahoma. The female will lay her eggs. The eggs will presumably hatch at some point. That generation will die off, and the new generation will continue to move further northward. We get monarchs generally in Kentucky in late May, early June. And the same thing will happen to the second and the third generations. They will lay their eggs. The eggs, hopefully, some of them, a small percentage, but some will develop actually into butterflies. That generation will die off. The new generation will move further north. Okay, adult butterflies probably don't live more than a month, at least not the first three generations. This is a picture of what a monarch caterpillar looks like uh, eating uh, milkweed. This is the chrysalis. You can see at the advanced stage on the right, the uh, wings of the monarch butterfly are already appearing. Caterpillar stage takes about two weeks. These are examples of milkweed. Uh, in Kentucky and this part of the world, we generally have three varieties, common milkweed, uh, swamp milkweed, and butterfly milkweed. This is what the common milkweed looks before the seed pods split open in the fall and the seeds fly out with little wings. You've all probably seen this in fields and forests. <clears throat> now we come to the fourth generation. This is the generation of monarch butterflies, generally speaking, born in the upper Midwest, mostly in the states of Minnesota, Wisconsin, Iowa, Michigan, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, and then in a little bit to Pennsylvania and New York. Other places as well, but this is the main area. And this fourth generation somehow is metabolically and physiologically different from the previous three generations. Uh, it experience, experiences what's called diapause, suspended development. Its metabolic activity is reduced. It does not waste energy on mating because it, it, it has to build up its lipid and protein reserves for the migration south, which generally runs two to 3,000 miles and will generally take about two months. 
So this generation of monarch butterflies is different. They store lipids and proteins for this uh, two-month migration. They have different flight muscle tissue. Uh, <clears throat> they require less oxygen. Uh, and they don't become reproductive again until the following March, assuming they survive the migration and mortality rates are very high, and assuming they uh, survive the winter roost in Mexico. This is a map that shows you the range of the monarch butterfly. There are actually three populations. The population west of the Rockies, unfortunately, is virtually extinct. It has declined by 86% in the last two years alone. And the Xerxes Society, <clears throat> which is uh, probably our uh, leading NGO that studies invertebrates, has, has, has already stated that within the next 20 years, we're probably going to see this generation, this uh, uh, species die off. There's also a small uh, <clears throat> subset population in and near Florida. But what we're talking about here is what's called the Eastern Monarch, and it's the monarch that exists east of the Rockies in the entire United States and a little bit into Canada, depending upon whether or not there is milkweed. <clears throat> the monarch winter roost is in the state of Michoacan. The capital city there is Moralia, and it is uh, identified here in yellow on the map of Mexico. The monarch bi biosphere, uh, these uh, mountaintops, these cloud forests where the monarchs overwinter, uh, was declared a, a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It consists of about 139,000 acres. And uh, actually, it's owned by 27,000 different edijos, which are the cooperatives, or the indigenous populations are the owners, which makes protecting it doubly difficult. <clears throat> the monarch butterfly roosts in oil fur. Oil fur grows between 7,200 and 10,800 feet. This is a vegetation map of Mexico. I don't know how clearly you can see this, but the oil forest forest is identified here in black. And you can see just a little dot here, a little dot there, a little dot there. There's not much of the oil fir forest left. In fact, only 2% of the historic oil uh, fir forest is left, which makes, of course, protecting what's left uh, extremely important. <clears throat> These are pictures I, I've taken uh, around the monarch roost. It's a very beautiful part of Mexico, very mountainous. Uh, those are butterflies flitting around in the air. These are pictures from the winter roost. You can see the monarchs uh, come together in clumps, which helps them stay warm. Uh, fortunately, this part of Mexico uh, doesn't freeze very often, but it remains cool so that the, the uh, state of torpor, the diapause state, uh, pretty much can remain intact over the winter. An example of a tree full of monarch butterflies. These are all pictures from the monarch winter roost. The slide on the upper left is interesting because if I had simply shown you that slide without any context and asked you what it was, you'd probably say, well, you know, it looks like a field full of dead weeds. What that is, is a field full of monarch butterflies in the winter. Periodically, they come en masse off of the trees and feed on these upland meadows, paramo they're called, feed the, constant, uh, the uh, condensation. So these are butterflies that have come down, hundreds of thousands of them from the trees to feed on the con condensation and get some uh, water. <clears throat> How do we measure the winter roost? We measure it aerially. You can do this with a light aircraft or in today's world with a drone. What you see there that looks orangey, orangey brown, that is the monarch roost. And we can measure it year by year 
uh, and, turn, and, and determine how many butterflies exist in that roost. Unfortunately, you can, as you can see from this bar graph, the trend line uh, has gone down almost at a 45 degree angle. In the late 90s, uh, in 97, 98, there were probably a billion monarchs and the winter roost um, occupied about 45 acres. You can see here the, uh, on the bar graph that since that year, it has steadily declined. If you look at the year 2013, the winter roost consisted of barely more than an acre. That's the size of a football field. Entomologists believe that if this population is to sustain itself, it needs at least 15 acres of winter roost consistently. Uh, <clears throat> we're a long way from 15 acres. As you can see, uh, 2014, there were a little bit more than two acres. Uh, 2019 and 2020 are not on this uh, table. We had a pretty good year in 2019. We almost hit 15 acres. But again, last year, we're down to seven acres. So you can see the trend line here, and it's not very encouraging. We have lost about 90% of the migratory monarch butterfly in the last 20 years. Why? There are a lot of reasons, and again, I, in a 20-minute presentation, I can't get into all of them. Deforestation in Mexico is obviously a big problem. And the problem has been exacerbated by the booming avocado industry. Most of the avocados we eat in the United States come from Michoacan, and avocado farming is done in and around the monarch roost. And what happens, of course, is that avocado farmers, uh, and you can't blame them because avocado uh, ag agriculture is very, very profitable, <clears throat> cut down a lot of trees, uh, they sometimes cut into the, the biosphere itself, even though that's illegal. Avocado trees take a lot of water. Uh, it affects the, the uh, water table. Those are problems. And of course, thinning of forest. Anytime you thin a forest, whether uh, you do it deliberately by putting a road through it or a power line through it, or perhaps a storm comes through and blows down a number of trees, you're changing the microclimate. You're uh, introducing predators. All of these things are very hard on the monarch butterfly. But the main problem in the United States is the development of GMO farming. Beginning in the 1990s, Monsanto and other corporations developed GMO crops, genetically modified crops. Almost all core bean, uh, corn and soybean, for example, in this country are GMO. GMO farming uh, has been a bonanza for farmers because it increases their crop yield, but it's been a disaster for the wild creatures that depend on these farms and ranches for survival. When you have GMO corn, GMO soybeans, you can spray literally millions of gallons of glyphosate. The, uh, uh, the main commercial name is Roundup, or neonicotinoids on these crops. The crops are not uh, <clears throat> uh, hampered in any way by the herbicides, but the weeds, the milkweeds, and the nectar-producing flowers are killed. So the enormous use of herbicides that kill off weeds and nectar-producing flowers since the 1990s have taken a very, very drastic toll. The ethanol mandate that Congress passed a few years ago has made things worse because it encourages farmers to plant corn. Our ethanol generally comes from corn, right up to the stream side, right up to the roadbed, uh, sometimes uh, even uh, plowing up conservation reserve uh, land. You can see the figures here. Uh, between 2008 and 2014, one set of figures, we lost about 24 million acres of habitat, mostly to farming. <clears throat> That's equal in size to the state of Indiana. Between 1996 and 2014, we've lost about 170 million acres of habitat, which is equal in size to the total acreage of Minnesota, Iowa, Wisconsin, and Illinois. That's a very, very big area. So the loss of milkweed and the loss of nectar-producing flowers because of the commercial spraying 
with Roundup or neonicotinoids. And incidentally, neonics, as they're often called, oftentimes the seed is coated. And when that seed germinates, those chemicals can come systemically through the plant and get into the nectar. So that they not only uh, can kill off a butterfly, but they can very, very badly harm uh, the bee colonies. Uh, we lose 40 to 50 percent of bee colonies every year. There are a variety of reasons for this, but one of the most important is the uh, widespread use of neonicotinoids, which incidentally are now banned in the European Union. So, again, you can see from the slide, most of our crops, cotton, fruits, flowers, etc., uh, are sprayed, either sprayed with neonics or grown from seed that is coated with neonics. Uh, neonicotinoids are addictive, much like nicotine is addictive for you and me. It remains in the soil, it's water soluble, so it gets into the streams, it's spread by dust. And this is, as, as I say, one of the reasons why uh, the, uh, the bee colonies are collapsing at record rates um, in this country. Climate change is a problem. Uh, in the winter roost areas, we've had three storms in the past 20 years that are supposed to occur only once every 500 years. We've had three in a 20 year period. One in 2002 killed off a quarter of a million monarchs. We're not quite sure how many died in the other two storms, but it was in the tens of thousands. <clears throat> Did I say 250,000? Is that what I said? That's what I meant to say, not 250 million. In any case, <clears throat> climate change is a, is a big factor too. Uh, if the temperatures in Mexico can, uh, if they warm too quickly, uh, the monarchs will leave. Migration is temperature sensitive. And if they leave too early and get to Texas and Oklahoma before the milkweed is ready, they won't be able to breed. Conversely, as the temperatures warm in the upper Midwest in the late summer and fall, uh, if the monarch delays its southward migration too long, the mortality rates during that migration increase because the likelihood of encountering uh, winter storms, of course, is much greater. So climate change uh, has been a problem, among other things. Here again is pretty much what I said. And on top of that, of course, we've had severe drought, particularly in places like Texas, Oklahoma, eastern New Mexico. Uh, <clears throat> California, which means that uh, the ability of pollinators like migrating monarch butterflies to find nectar producing flowers uh, becomes difficult and, and in many cases impossible. Is there hope? For the West Coast population, probably not. Uh, it is down to less than, 10 less than 1 percent of its historic population. For the broader eastern monarch population, uh, <clears throat> there is some hope. President Obama took an interest in this issue and met with the uh, Prime Minister of Canada and the President of Mexico, declared Interstate 35, which is the, probably the main migratory route, the monarch uh, highway. And in 2015, they established uh, what's called NIFWIF, the National Fish and Wildlife Conservation Fund, which has an entire uh, subdivision devoted to monarch conservation. The goal here is to uh, plant one and a third billion new milkweed plantings in the next 20 years. Whether that will be enough, quickly enough, remains to be seen. But this organization, which is uh, sponsored both by governments and private initiative, uh, gives grants. My organization actually got a grant last year from them, although we're no longer eligible because they will no longer fund projects that lie outside of the boundaries of the United States. And of course, since we work in Mexico, we're no longer eligible. The goal, as I said before, is to ensure at least 15 acres consistently of winter roost in Mexico. <clears throat> One interesting possibility for the future, and this is of course in a very embryonic stage at this point, 
is the use of agrobots and electricide. These are robots. These are robots that are being developed to locate and kill selected weeds via electrical charge. In other words, kill off the weeds without, without having to rely on these dangerous and lethal herbicides. Artificial intelligence is getting better in identifying various weeds that can be killed without chemical herbicides. Other agrobots can hoe, seed, and fertilize. And they can adjust the dosage for individual plants without spraying an entire field. Now, again, uh, this is an industry that's just beginning to uh, get off its feet. It's largely experimental at this point. But if this industry becomes, as I think it will, um, uh, inexpensive enough so that farmers and ranchers can afford to use it, I think it's probably the wave of the future. And it would be a means uh, for farmers and ranchers to maintain their crop yields without having to rely on heavy use of fertilizer and heavy use of herbicides. Habitat exchange is one, you know, paying farmers and ranchers who own much of the land, incidentally, to keep marginal sections of their land into habitat is being experimented with. The problem is it's very expensive, and organizations that do this, like the Environmental Defense Fund, uh, have to raise a lot of money to uh, accomplish this. The Monarch Joint Venture is an example of an organization that has arisen to coordinate efforts by states, NGOs, like our organization for monarch conservation. Uh, Kentucky has a monarch conservation plan. So do most states. Iowa, for example, uh, is committed to planting uh, something around 800,000 acres of milkweed, again, by the year 2038, whether that will be enough uh, remains to be seen, but it certainly is an encouraging start. The Monarch Way Stations, uh, the Garden Clubs of America have taken on this cause. We have one here at Center, we have one at the Deaf School, there's several in Danville. Uh, there are hundreds now in Kentucky and, and hundreds more around the world. These little, uh, little gardens uh, where flowers that uh, continue to bloom into the late fall before the frost, like zinnias, uh, asters, etc. Uh, they don't look like much individually, but collectively they make a big difference because they provide the kind of nectar producing flowers that monarch butterflies and other pollinators need, particularly uh, in the late summer and the fall when a lot of other things have already begun to die off. For example, uh, I tell my students, if you were to drive from Minnesota to Texas and your dad said, sure, take the car, there's probably plenty of gas stations on the way, oh, there are probably at least 75 gas stations on the way, and you say, good, but then you learn that 35 of those stations are in Minnesota and 40 are in Texas, you're not going to get very far because unless you can get gasoline in these intermediate states, you're not going to progress, and it's the same thing with the butterfly. It needs nectar producing flowers and root. So these little garden plots sponsored by the uh, uh, Garden Clubs of America and others are very important. And then finally, the La Cruz Habitat Protection Project. Uh, website address is forestformonarchs.org. Uh, we plant trees in and around the monarch winter roost We've planted 9 million trees in the past decade or so. We've done 300,000 this year, and we plan to do another 300,000 next year. We plant oil mill fir, but also fast-growing pines and fir for the local uh, population, which can use then the, the trees for firewood or erosion control. These are badly degraded areas, I should say and that uh, then will discourage them from cutting into the protected areas. I should add also that we've been very generously assisted in the past four years by MHAIA, which is the Mexican Haas Avocado Importers Association, and by the uh, Cincinnati-based Meshua Foundation. And then this year, for the first time, the uh, 
Doolin Foundation for Biodiversity. Organizations such as these have helped us greatly uh, maintain our mission, which is to plant the trees and protect the forest in the hopes that uh, we can protect what's left of this iconic species and uh, hopefully uh, assist in its survival. And then finally, there's the monarch butterfly. Thank you very much for listening.